welcome to all. Uh, it's a great honor to especially welcome uh, our colleague and my friend Joe Stiglitz and his wife Anya Schifrin who are here with us again at CEU. It's a very exciting time to have them here. As you can see, Joe is a rock star who always needs a larger hall. So we are very pleased to be able to have this larger hall here and uh, other halls that are participating that I'll mention in just a moment. Um, I want to uh, give a special welcome to members of the Prime Minister's Office who are here tonight and others from the Hungarian government who are here as well as uh, distinguished members of the diplomatic corps uh, here in Hungary. It's a, privilege to welcome all of you. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm pleased to note, above all, that we are joined today by CEU's founder, uh, George Soros, uh, and by students and faculty from many universities in Hungary and Slovakia. I'll just mention those that I think are represented. Um, Corvinus, Elta, Debrecen, Seged, the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, also four institutions in Slovakia, uh, Prashovska, Nitra, Selya Janos, and the Balashi Institute uh, are all represented uh, here, not only in this hall, but uh, also in the uh, CEU Auditorium, where we are broadcasting or live streaming this event, and it's being live streamed as well on the internet and I'm very pleased to say that there's a special audience at Columbia University. So hello to all of you at Columbia University. I was kidding Joe that maybe he, maybe they don't see him enough at Columbia University, so he has to come to Budapest to be seen, but I'm sure that's not the case. Um, Joe Stiglitz is the best kind of academic rock star. Uh, he's one of the world's leading economists who's also, if I may say, a great guy. He's somebody that is very wonderful to get to know. You all know that he's a two-time Nobel laureate. He received the 2001 Nobel Prize in Economics for his analyses of markets with asymmetric information. And he uh, received a share of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize as the lead author uh, of the report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, extremely important in 1995, the most uh, cutting edge panel report that was done as that issue began to emerge as one of the great unsolved challenges for humanity. Um, I first met Joe when we were colleagues in the Clinton administration in the 1990s, period of ancient history, um, before he received his Nobel Prizes, and I can report that um, he is still as open and approachable today after his Nobel Prizes as he was then when I got first to know him. He has many achievements and accolades in his career. Let me just cite a few and leave the rest to my colleague, Julius Horvat, who's here with us on stage, the head of the CEU Economics Department, who will chair the lecture. Professor Stiglitz received his PhD from MIT in 1967. Uh, he's a university professor at Columbia. He has taught previously uh, at Princeton, Stanford, MIT, and Oxford. He's been the chief economist of the World Bank. He's been the chairman of President Clinton's Council of Economic Advisors. He's been the chairman of the UN Commission on Reform of the International Monetary and Financial Systems. He's widely cited as one of the world's most influential economists. He's the author of 11 books, I think I have the number right, including most recently his remarkable bestseller, The Price of Inequality, How Today's Divided Society Endangers Our Future. Um, we've invited Joe Stiglitz to see you to be a keynote speaker in our ongoing series of lectures and conferences on frontiers of democracy. There are many challenges and disagreements concerning democratic governance across the world today in many countries, certainly in our, my country in the United States. 
There are many shortcomings and failures in existing institutions of political and economic order. And I'd say that the financial crisis of 2008 is perhaps the most dramatic example of the breakdown of economic governance, uh, the failure of the dominant school of economic orthodoxy to uh, demonstrate what was happening and the assumption that financial markets are self-correcting and predictable. So Joe Stiglitz is at the forefront of efforts to challenge conventional economic thinking. He's one of the founders of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, uh, which promotes alternative approaches to building sustainable political economies. This is one of the most important frontiers of democracy issues today, and one of the most important subjects for us to examine. And so through these lectures, we are going to be pre presenting many points of view, each of which is intended to stimulate debate and discussion on the meaning of democracy in the 21st century. And I can't imagine a better person to keynote this series than our distinguished speaker tonight. So please join me in welcoming Joseph Stiglitz. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here again. Um, the, uh, this lecture is based on, on my most recent book with Bruce Greenwald, so it's a little bit of a thick book. Uh, and I hope uh, to, uh, that many of you will uh, read the book after my lecture, and maybe some of you might actually buy it. Uh, <laughs> I, I know uh, many of you are uh, caught in suspense by uh, the an what my answer to this question will be. And uh, this suspense may interfere with your ability to listen carefully to the arguments. So uh, let me tell you uh, what the answer to the question is, and then I'll explain. The rest of the talk is about explaining the answer. The answer is uh, a very strong uh, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, illiberal democracies cannot create shared and sustained prosperity. So let me try to explain uh, uh, what the argument is. For more than 2,000 years, standards of living stagnated, caught between slight improvements in technology and Malthusian population increases. And since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, standards of living have soared. And the typical person today lives better in many respects than royalty did hundreds of years ago. And I prepared just a few charts to show uh, the magnitude of, of these changes. And to show, I could have gone uh, before 1000, and you would have seen uh, the year 1000, seen exactly the same thing. Nothing happened. Nothing la really literally happened for hundreds and hundreds of years. But you see from the year 1000 here to the year 1800, uh, standards of living hardly budged. Uh, and then, beginning around 1800, uh, they began to move up a little bit before that in UK and uh, uh, Western Europe. And then, beginning uh, actually in the middle of the uh, last century in some uh, of the emerging markets like India and China. And you can uh, look at this data from a number of perspectives, and this is a a similar chart looking at real wages of London craftsmen. And you see the same fact that but for, for, with a, a number of wiggles, uh, wages remain basically stagnant for literally hundreds and hundreds of years and then suddenly increased. And it's not only in terms of uh, wages, material well-being, uh, what was going on uh, was uh, similarly affecting uh, uh, health, life expectancy. So what this uh, demonstrates is the, 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 the enormous changes that have happened in the last uh, 200 years. This has led economists to ask, to what do we attribute these increases in standards of living? And uh, this talk is going to provide uh, part of the answer. There are three explanations that economists have focused on. One is the accumulation of capital. 
The second is the improvements in allocative efficiency. And the third is learning, learning how to do things better. The evidence is overwhelming that the latter, learning, is responsible for the vast bulk of the increase in the standards of living. The transformation to learning societies that occurred around 1800 for Western economies, or more recently for those in Asia, appears to have had a far, far greater impact on human well-being than improvements either in uh, allocative efficiency or resource accumulation. Uh, my own teacher, Bob Solo, uh, who received a Nobel Prize, was the first to quantify the relative importance of uh, uh, learning improvements in technology. Uh, and he, his estimate at the time was that something like 80% of the increases in standards of living were a result of learning. And the other 20%, maybe less than that, 10 20%, had to do with uh, accumulation of capital. The idea, of course, was recognized earlier by the great uh, economist of the 20th century, Joseph Schumpeter. The interesting thing is that his work, his ideas about the importance of, of innovation were never introduced into the mainstream of economics that focused more on resource accumulation and allocative efficiency. Well, the next question, after one uh, realizes that the important issue is learning, what caused the change? What happened suddenly, as we look back uh, on uh, this historical chart, that can uh, explain why we went from stagnation to this enormous increase in standards of living? In many ways, this is the most important thing that's happened uh, in, in history. Uh, well, uh, the argument that I put forward, we put forward in our book is that the enlightenment, the enlightenment that, uh, for instance, was, began in Scotland, was absolutely critical. And what was it about the enlightenment? It was questioning authority. It was recognizing that change was possible that the scientific method provided a systematic way of figuring out how to improve productivity. And productivity meant getting more outputs from the given input. Now, I don't have time uh, this evening to trace back uh, the sources of the Enlightenment, what happened to, to cause these changes uh, suddenly in the, uh, in the 18th uh, century. Uh, but what I want to do is to uh, uh, outline, or at least to discuss, some of the implications. So let me outline what I will do in the remainder of this lecture. First, I'm going to draw out the strong implications that this observation has on where the focus of policy should be, the implications for our political structures, and the implications for inequality. As I will explain, I think there is a close nexus between creating and sustaining a learning society, establishing liberal democracies, and creating a more egalitarian society. I will then focus on the two main insights for economic policy. The first is that markets on their own will not create a learning society. And the second is that government action is not only required, but, essential, but essentially every government action has some impact enhancing or impeding the creation of a learning society. I'll then illustrate the general propositions with a couple of examples. So first, let me begin with uh, two of the uh, broad uh, and very strong implications for public policy, including the structure of our democracy. First. Our focus should be on the impact of policies on learning. In the case of developing countries, the focus should be on the diffusion of knowledge uh, from developed to developing countries. One of the points that I emphasized when I was chief economist of the World Bank is that what separates developed from developing countries is not just a gap in resources, which had been the focus of concern, the argument for why the World Bank 
was founded. It was a concern about a gap in resources between developed and developing countries. But we argued that it was what separated the developed from developing countries was also, or even more importantly, a gap in knowledge. And that if uh, developing countries were to develop, there had to be uh, policies undertaken to reduce that gap in knowledge. But as we point out in, in, in our book, even in developed countries, there are large gaps between best and average practices. And so that by creating a more, uh, doing a better job of creating a learning society, you close the gap between the best practices and the average, or the gap between the best and the bottom. And in doing so, you uh, have a significant impact on improving standards of living. So in short, the successful and sustained growth requires creating a learning society, especially in the 21st century as we move to a knowledge economy. The reason this focus is especially important, as I'll suggest a little bit later on when I come to the concrete examples, is that many of the policies that have been advocated, for instance, within the Washington Consensus while they might improve allocative efficiency or promote resource accumulation, actually impede learning. So there's a tension quite often between what is good for these standard uh, uh, focus of economic policy, resource accumulation and, and allocative efficiency, and the far more important learning. And so if you impede learning over the long run, you impede the standards of living. Well, there are many aspects of creating a learning society. For instance, we learn through research, and uh, as we emphasize in our book, we learn by doing. The creation of a learning society is affected by all of our institutions, not just the obvious ones like the patent system and the education system, although at the end I'm gonna talk about both of those. The second broad implication is that creating a learning society entails more than just economics. It involves politics. The reason we titled our book Creating a Learning Society was that our argument is that it, it really is a, a, a change in mindset. It was interesting, I was, um, uh, last week I was in Netherlands and uh, their government had, uh, uh, their, one of the uh, government think tank had come out with a very interesting report about uh, using almost the words of our, our, our book, creating a learning economy. And uh, part of our discussion was why that focus on creating a learning economy hadn't gone far enough. That in fact what had to be done is creating a learning society. Creating a learning society is, includes about, uh, is about political institutions and social norms. The Enlightenment, which brought about the changes which have led to these enormous increases in standard of, li of living, also brought about political changes, the creation of liberal democracies. I want to suggest that the increasing standards of living could only have been sustained if our society had continued to learn and our society have could have continued to learn to be a dynamic society only with a liberal democracy. Thus, I unabashedly answer the question, can an illiberal state create sustaining shares, shared prosperity with an emphatic no? Let me describe a little bit more uh, on the, uh, uh, the relationship between democracy and the creation of a learning society. The Enlightenment, creating a learning society uh, and democracy, have always been closely linked. And there are two of these links that, uh, a few of these links that I want to focus on. The first I already mentioned is that, that science questions authority just like uh, democracy does. The second is that science, like democracy, requires an open society, a free flow of information. In the United States, in spite of the fact that our success has been based in technology and science, there is an increasing 
anti-scientific mentality. There's a skepticism, for instance, about global warming or even evolution. Uh, as one of my friends point, pointed out in the government, uh, he had to constantly relitigate the Enlightenment. And this gets reflected in a whole number of uh, concrete policy decisions. There dis there's decreasing budgetary support for science, even though we are very clearly a, a science-based, uh, the, the success of the United States, the high-tech sector, Silicon Valley, is all based in science. The percentage of our national budget that goes to science has been decreasing. Uh, it's the lowest level it's been in decades. These failures are cause and consequence of a failure to create the kind of learning society that is needed for long-term success, except among a relatively small elite. Indeed, America's success has increasingly relied on young people coming from elsewhere around the world. But as critical as I may be of the United States, there are other places where the Enlightenment values are being put to a far more severe test. For while these societies may do well, as authoritarian techniques may be used in the process of catching up. But after they have gone through the initial stage of catch up, to sustain that growth, these societies have learned that they must change, that they must become more open. No authoritarian society has been able to sustain the kinds of advances that are associated uh, with uh, what has happened in the uh, post-Enlightenment world. In short, Creating a learning society is about, above all, a change in mindset. And the learning society mindset can only be sustained, I believe, within a liberal democracy. The title of my talk was about sustained and shared prosperity. And so let me spend a few minutes on the political economy of inclusiveness and openness. There are complex Interlinkings, uh, interlinkages between these concepts. Our understanding of the links between true democracy, growth, and shared prosperity have changed markedly in the last decade. First, we have learned that economies with greater equality are more likely to have higher sustained growth. Uh, this is a view, for instance, that has been articulated by the IMF, not viewed in general as the most left-wing institution. Uh, this idea uh, has now become mainstream and was the main point of my book, The Price of Inequality. Uh, the Price of Inequality said that we pay a high price for our inequality. It's not just a moral issue. We pay a high price in terms of a dividing society, in terms of undermining our democracy, but we also pay a high price for our economy that economies with high levels of inequality do not perform as well. There's a whole theory uh, that I articulate in the book about why that is so, and a, a whole body of research uh, that now explains why that is so. Secondly, we have seen that economic inequalities translate into political, ine political inequalities. In that sense, there's a vicious circle. Societies with a high level of economic inequality wind up with political inequalities, which then lead to more the rules of the game, which sustain those and exacerbate those economic inequalities. Uh, there are a number of reasons, uh, some number of mechanisms by which this vicious circle uh, gets perpetuated. Um, among them, is that in the absence of a strong liberal democracy, there are insufficient checks on corruption. Uh, as an aside, let me mention what one of the words that has often been abused in recent years is the term rule of law. Uh, everybody's in favor of the rule of law, but what is interesting is how often that term is misunderstood. The way the rule of law, what we nor what should mean by the rule of law is a legal system that protects ordinary individuals, that protects, exposed to protect uh, the weak and, and, and the people who need protection. But in some countries, what the rule of law means is the protection of the wealthy, the elites. They do it within a framework of law, 
And you see that in Russia. You see where they call it a rule of law, they call it, they say that they're doing something within the rule of law, they use legal frameworks, but they use legal, they, or I should say they abuse legal frameworks to create, to use, to serve the elite, to, to, to serve the powerful, um, to um, uh, actually uh, create more inequality. As I talk about Russia, I should emphasize no one should look at what has happened in Russia as a success. Uh, Russia's GDP has performed uh, not particularly well, not particularly badly, but if you look more carefully at the source of their growth, it's totally based on oil and gas, just like poor African countries. Some of them have done very well. If you happen to be endowed with a high endow a large endowment of na a gas and oil, and the price of oil goes from $20 a barrel to $120 a barrel, uh, you're going to do very well. But it's not a result of good economic management. In fact, if you look at what's happened in the case of Russia, there's been a process of deindustrialization. Uh, a weakening of the economy, a shortening of lifespan. People live longer. Here I show what's happened in the rest of the world uh, and uh, the increase in life expectancy since eight, uh, 1820. But what has happened in recent years in Russia is that life expectancies have decreased. And that's a failure. Uh, it's a symbol, it's a, it's a, 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 a symptom of a, a society that is not functioning well. But finally, one of the things that, that uh, the Commission on the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress that I shared uh, emphasized is that well-being is not just measured by adding up the goods and services produced in the economy. Well-being is not just measured by GDP. Uh, there's broader uh, concerns that go into measuring of uh, assessment of well-being. And among those are participation in political life. And uh, that has been undermined in Russia. Let me emphasize that the critique of non-inclusive growth goes beyond that as a waste of a country's most valuable resource, its human talent, to fail to ensure that everyone was up to his or her potential. It goes to the consequences for the nature of society and the polity. Uh, government needs to play, for instance, an important role in any economy, correcting pervasive market failures, but especially in the creative economy. In a society with very little inequality, the only role of the state is to provide collective goods and correct market failures. However, when there are large inequalities, interests differ, distributive battles inevitably rage, and to prevent redistribution, the role of government is circumscribed. But in circumscribing government, the ability to perform positive roles is also circumscribed. But the nexus between politics and economics is still more complex. For in illiberal polities, as I have suggested, for, a little, uh, for illiberal polities, as I have suggested, do not have the checks in place to ensure shared prosperity and the absence of shared prosperity often gives rise to illiberal social attitudes which are antithetical to an open society which is so essential itself to a learning society. I described earlier the weakening of support for the Enlightenment in the US. This in turn, I believe, is closely related to the country's growing inequality to the point where the US has become the most unequal society among the advanced countries. And among the advanced countries, the country with the least equality of opportunity. Let me make one more prefatory remark which echoes something that I uh, said just a minute ago. Uh, I've emphasized the important increases in standards of living that raises the question to what end should learning be directed? How do we ensure that the learning that occurs results in higher standards of living? What that entails and how it can be increased should and can be a subject of rational inquiry. And this 
was the subject, in fact, of the San Fatusi Stiglitz International Commission on the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress that I alluded to earlier. Much of the innovation in advanced industrial economies has been directed toward saving labor. But in many developing countries, labor is in surplus and unemployment is the problem. Uh, and that's also true increasingly in developed countries where unemployment uh, has become significant. The average unemployment rate in Europe is 12 uh, percent. Labor-saving innovations simply exacerbate this key social problem. So it is natural resources, the environment, which is underpriced, and innovation needs to be directed at saving resources and protecting the environment. We need a new model of innovation. And that just echoes the point what matters is not GDP, but the quality of life, well-being, and individual capabilities. Since the key aspects of what constitutes the quality of life are collectively provided and can only be defined in a social context, it is only through democratic, deliberative, and open processes that this can be determined. I would go further. Participation in civic life including democratic political processes, is itself part of what one means when one refers to the quality of life. The problem with Western liberal democracies is not that they have given too much rein to, the fr to free expression, but they have not yet su succeeded enough in giving effective voice and meaningful participation to large parts of their societies. So let me return now to the economics of creating a learning society, the more mundane part of this talk. Um, there are two uh, key insights that I've mentioned briefly, but let me reiterate. The first is the markets on their own will not do a good job at creating a learning society. There needs to be systematic, system, systematic interventions by the government. Anna Smith would have recognized this, an example of what had come to be called market failures, where markets do not produce sufficient outcomes, but his latter-day followers seemingly have not. Let me re reiterate, there is no theory that says that markets where innovations are important are efficient either in the rate or direction of innovation, uh, that they're efficient either in the rate or direction of learning. Quite the contrary. Presumption is, not, is that they are not. There are several underlying market failures. Let me just list them very briefly. Markets where innovation, uh, where innovation is important tend, for good reasons, to have limited competition. If we look around the markets that have been most innovative, like, say, Google, uh, Microsoft, uh, 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 the Internet, uh, uh, high tech, Many of these industries are dominated by one, two, or three firms. And there are good reasons that we explained in our book why these sectors tend to be, uh, have limited competition. Uh, and it's only when you have a high degree of competition that markets lead to efficiency. Secondly, innovation is risky. And these are risks that cannot be insured for good reason, explained by the theory of asymmetric information. But one of the basic ideas, the Arrow de Brew theorem that proved that markets were efficient, assumed that there were a full set of risk markets. In the absence of a full set of risk markets, markets are not, in general, efficient. Thirdly, innovation requires investments, uh, often very large investments, and capital markets are typically imperfect. Uh, and loans, for R&D in particular, cannot be collateralized. As a result, there is an underinvestment in R&D. Fourthly, there are important spillovers, what economists refer to as externalities. Others benefit uh, in many ways. In fact, knowledge is what economists call a public good. And uh, this is a technical term, but what it means is that uh, as opposed to, say, a chair or a table, when one person is sitting in a chair, it's difficult for another person to sit in that chair. If one person consumes food, it's difficult for another person to consume that food. But knowledge is different. Uh, as I've just told you what I know, 
a little bit. Uh, you now know it, but I still know it. Uh, actually, Thomas Jefferson, America's third president, put it much more poetically than economists uh, did when he described knowledge was like a candle. When one candle likes another candle, it doesn't diminish from the light of the first candle. So that's very different from the conventional uh, economic good. And um, once, when there are these public goods, they'll be undersupplied because the benefits can reach all of society. Because some of the private returns to innovation consist of appropriating returns that others would have received, what sometimes referred to as rank sailing, private returns in some areas actually can exceed social returns. Uh, the obvious example is uh, a Me Too in innovation. Uh, in fact, there's an argument that uh, a, a number of, uh, a, a, a significant part of the returns to innovation is uh, associated with what's called the enclosure of the knowledge commons, privatizing knowledge that otherwise would have been uh, public, slowing down on follow-on innovations. Uh, and the patent system encourages firms to take out of the knowledge pool as much as they can and contribute as little as they can. The result of this is the size of the knowledge pool um, which is the most important determinant of the pace of innovation is diminished, and the overall pace of innovation, therefore, is slowed down. Um, there are many other examples where the private returns exceed the social returns. Let me just give you one that illustrates the, uh, the point, and that is uh, an important decision, an uh, important issue that recently uh, was just uh, went to the Supreme Court of the United States, and that is the question of gene patents, patents on genes. Uh, you might think that you own your genes, but until recently, uh, that's uh, not necessarily true. Uh, and there was a, uh, the genes uh, that are called the BRAC genes, which if you have those two genes, uh, the probability of getting breast cancer was very high, over 50%. And there was a, a uh, international effort to decode the human genome that was successful, was on its way, but a private company called Myriad, located in Utah, raced to get that information, that knowledge, a little bit faster than anybody else before the public effort. So it had no social value because it just got the information, the knowledge, just a few, a few months before it otherwise would have been discovered in the systematic process of the decoding of the human genome. But because it was first, it got the patent. And because it got the patent, its interest was not to make sure people didn't get breast cancer. Its interest was to maximize profits. So what did it do? It charged an extraordinarily high price for testing for the human genome, for the, whether you had this gene. But it was worse than that. Yale University discovered a better test than their test. And it was willing to supply this test free But Myriad wanted the data. It wanted the profits and said no. And because it, their test was not accurate, the result of that, people died. Uh, it, it was very clear Myriad was putting profits over lives. And this issue then eventually went to the Supreme Court of the United States uh, and uh, eventually the Supreme Court uh, ruled that you could not patent genes. A very important ruling. But the point I want to make is this is an example of a social return, the, of, of a private return, which was uh, uh, very high, but the social return from this patent was actually negative. There are many other examples that I could talk about, uh, 
patent trolls and holdups, patents to hold up, uh, hold up other innovators, um, innovation in the financial sector to circumvent regulations to make economy, uh, designed to make the economy safer, which have no social return. Uh, innovations like those of Microsoft to extend and enhance market power, um, such, and the drug companies have a process called evergreening. So, uh, the bottom line I want to emphasize is that uh, markets are not in general efficient in either the level of resources devoted to innovation to learning or in the direction. The, 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 the implication of this is that the most important theorem in conventional economics, some of you may have studied this uh, as uh, uh, students, uh, Adam Smith's Invisible Hand was that the market leagues as if by an invisible hand, the pursuit of self-interest leagues as if by an invisible hand um, is not true. The reason the invisible hand is invisible is that it's not there. <laughs> and that means there is an important role for government to ensure that, uh, for, for government to ensure that there is uh, the right level and direction of innovation. But one can only be sure that the government will be doing this in a way that benefits society rather than benefit a few people in the elite is if you have a liberal democracy. Secondly, as we think about the effects of policies on learning, uh, this approach often leads one to different views from those associated with standard models. For instance, the conventional Washington consensus policies often impede learning. So, as I said at the beginning of my talk, once one takes the view, comes to the perspective that most of the increases in standard of living, most of the increases in standard of living are associated with learning, the question from policy ought to be, what can you do to promote learning? And this is a markedly different perspective than the standard question, which focuses on static efficiency, moving countries to the frontier of the pro production possibility scare, uh, curve, or moving the frontier out as a result of the accumulation of resources. As I said, the question is especially salient because the two policies may be in conflict. Um, let me give you some examples. Um, as I said before, I think Adam Smith would have understood this, but is a view that is very antithetical to modern-day Smithians. And uh, the examples I'm going to uh, uh, give will highlight uh, that point. Let me begin, since I've talked about intellectual property already, let me begin by talking about intellectual property because I think it illustrates uh, uh, the point very, very forcefully. Intellectual property represents a uh, restriction, an inefficiency in the economy, because it's a restriction on the flow of knowledge. Uh, as I said, once knowledge is produced, the efficient uh, policy would be allow, to allow the free flow of knowledge. Why do we allow, it, it, what intellectual property then is stops that free flow of knowledge? Now, the argument is the reason that we are willing to uh, accept this restriction on the efficient use of knowledge is that in doing so, we'll promote the creation of more knowledge. So there's a static and a dynamic trade-off. That we, we are aware that when we restrict the flow of knowledge, we are introducing a distortion in the economy but the reason we accept this distortion is the hope that it will create a more dynamic economy. But if we don't get the rules right, if we don't think through what we're doing, if we don't realize that the whole purpose of intellectual property is to create more knowledge, we actually will adopt rules that will interfere with creating a learning society. So let me, let me uh, 
try to illustrate uh, that um, uh, with a, uh, some some examples. Uh, the most the reason why there can be a negative effect of intellectual property on the production of knowledge on innovation are several. One of them is, if you think about, for those who do do research, what is the most important input into your research? What do you do when you begin a research project? You look at prior research. As Newton said, everybody stands on the shoulders of people who've gone before. But intellectual property makes it more difficult to get access to other people's research. So the result of that is that the most vital input into the production of knowledge is more restricted. The second thing is observable in some American universities where uh, we passed a law called the Bayh-Dole Law. You don't have to worry about the details, but got the universities more involved in patents. The idea was that to try to make universities more commercial. But what's the consequence of that? Once there's money on the table, behavior has changed. And the basis of a university, which is open society, open discussion, discussion of ideas everywhere, changed. People were afraid that if they discussed their ideas openly, somebody would take their ideas and make a commercial value out of them. They might rush to the patent office and get the patent first. So we changed the open architecture of a university into greater secrecy. Um, so these are a, a couple of the ways in which a poorly designed intellectual property regime may impede innovation. The details of the rules make a difference. For instance, one of the differences between the United States intellectual property regime and that of Europe is a, a, a little known detail called opposition. Uh, if I have an idea and I go to the patent office, the question is, how do those who think you shouldn't get a patent, what, how, how can they oppose my, grant, my being granted a patent? There's a big difference between asking for a patent and opposing a patent. What's the difference? When I get a patent, I'm privatizing knowledge. I'm taking something that otherwise would be public and I'm making it into my private property. When I oppose a patent, I take something that otherwise would be private and I make it public, I make it open. But if I do that, when I create something that's open, what am I doing? I'm creating a public good. And the basic idea that I've mentioned several times already is there's an undersupply of public goods. So if you don't make it easy to oppose a patent, you will have a vastly undersupply of opposition and you'll get too many patents. You get patents that are not good patents. What do I mean by that? You're, I'll give you an example of what is a bad patent um, uh, that happened actually in the United States. Um, I don't know how many of you have had basmati rice, uh, good Indian rice. Well, in the United States, uh, we, before we had uh, as much immigration of Indians as we do today, uh, we all had to suffer with Uncle Bang's rice, which was very bad, bland. I, I, uh, um, then uh, basmati rice uh, started coming in, and there was an American company that took out a patent on basmati rice. Now, the fact that people had been uh, consuming basmati rice in India for 2,000 years uh, was not known to the uh, patent office in Virginia. Uh, they had tasted Uncle Ben's rice, and basmati rice was a marked improvement. And they said, this is really a, an achievement. Uh, so they granted the patent. The usual way that, that you challenge a patent is to look at the 
uh, is there any published, uh, has anybody published anything about it? Well, as you can imagine, nobody published anything about basmati rice because you can't publish something that everybody knows about except for the patent office. <laughs> so there was no published record of somebody say, saying, I discovered basmati rice. So the patent office says, I see no record here of somebody claiming to be the discoverer of basmati rice. So he gave the patent to the basmati rice. Now, this is a real case, let me tell you. So this is, and there are a lot of other cases like this. In the case of India, uh, the Indian government said this is really outrageous, and they challenged the patent. But there are many other patents where it's genetic material from a poor country where the country or the, uh, doesn't have the ability to challenge that. But the point I want to make is that in Europe, at least you have a framework for challenge the a patent, which is much better than that in the United States. So uh, that's an example of trying to get a balanced intellectual property regime. Uh, in the absence of a balanced intellectual property regime, the dynamic benefits are far less than the, co than the static cost, uh, and in fact, uh, a poorly designed intellectual property regime can actually impede creating a learning society. Uh, and this is obviously especially important uh, when you start to come to issues uh, like health, access to health, and the example of the myriad patent uh, illustrates. Let me turn to uh, a second application. Uh, probably nothing is as important in creating a learning society as education. It's obviously central to creating a learning society. But we have to think about how about the nature of the education system, the education process, and how it's going to change as technology and the economy changes. Uh, we need, for instance, to focus on learning to learn. Uh, we have to focus on lifelong learning. Uh, we, the, the, uh, we can think of the education process as occurring in at least two different stages. Uh, learning in schools. Um, my my uh, co-author, Bruce Greenwald, describes this as learning where you're unmotivated, unrelated to anything that you're uh, 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 actually uh, 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 directly concerned with. Uh, you sit in uh, seats and get bored. Um, and uh, on the job training, where you're motivated by the, by the work and you're motivated with, with, with economics and direct incentives. Anyway, he, 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 he actually thinks that, that the on-the-job training is much more important. But w I actually think that they are, they're both an important part uh, of the process. Um, but the rela relationship between the two is changing with changing technology. So for instance, we used to think of what you do is in the first 12, 16 years, uh, you try to stuff as much knowledge into the brain with the view that once they leave school, they're not going to get any more knowledge. And you try to stuff as much as you can in a, in, in a short a period as you can. And then you hope that somehow they use that knowledge. The internet has changed that. No matter how much you stuff in, there's more stuff on the internet than you could possibly put into a person's brain in 16 years. So education now is much more focused on how do you access information, and even more, how do you judge information? What is reliable information? How do you uh, evaluate it? Uh, how do you interpret it? So it's a very different process from a process that, it, what, the old process of stuffing uh, information. But it's not only what goes on in the schools has changed, on the job education has changed because of a change in the workplace. It used to be, for instance, that a, a company like General Motors could have their own university because people who went to work at General Motors would stay there for the rest of their life. But now, job turnover is very rapid. And that means 
that the incentive for an employer to train somebody who's only going to be there for a few years is greatly attenuated. And that means that there have to be ways of getting education for those who are on the job, but not through their employer on their own responsibility. And there are new developments like uh, the MOOCs, uh, the, the online courses, which are responding to this changing needs in the marketplace. Uh, so these, are, these represent some of the, the changes in our education system uh, uh, that uh, are absolutely essential if we are going to sustain being a creating a, a learning society and a learning economy. The similar kind of change in perspective is important, uh, equally important for developing countries. Uh, for instance, when, uh, uh, before I came to the World Bank, the standard focus in the World Bank was on primary education. And you could understand that. The view was that you wanted to educate everybody, resources were limited, egalitarian policies were to give a little bit of education to everybody. But the problem with that was if everybody was getting just a primary education, you would never be able to close the knowledge gap between the developing and developed countries. You would never be able to create a learning society in the developing countries. And so one of the big changes that occurred after the uh, World Development Report that was issued uh, the first year that I was uh, chief economist was to say that at least a fraction of the money had to be spent to create advanced institutions, institutions that would enable these societies to close the gap with the more advanced countries. Yes, you had to pay attention to inequality, you had to pay attention to, uh, uh, but, and even, even at the primary schools, there was a change in focus. What it said is, rather than learning the kings of England, which is what people used to learn in Kenyan schools, you ought to be learning how to become a better farmer, how to learn as even in a primitive, even in a primary school, you can learn about how to absorb new knowledge about being a farmer. Finally, let me talk very briefly about industrial policies. Some sectors of the economy, in particular industrial sectors, and new service sectors, have more learning potential, greater responsiveness of learning to production or investments in R&D, and greater learning spillovers to other sectors. And if that is true, markets will underinvest in those sectors. Uh, and again, uh, that means that um, uh, there is scope for what are called industrial policies. When we use the term industrial policies, all we mean is that direct interventions in how the market allocates resources. Uh, either across sectors, across technologies. Uh, there was an active debate in the United States about industrial policies. One of my predecessors as chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors once said, it doesn't make any difference whether we produce computer chips or potato chips. But I thought he was wrong, that a society that just produced potato chips would be less of a learning society than one that produced computer chips. That there were spillovers to many other industries from the production of computer chips that would lead to a more dynamic uh, economy. Unfortunately, neoliberal doctrines prescribed many of these policies. Um, in fact, though, if you look around the world, the most successful countries were those that adopted such policies. For instance, particular example, you look uh, some 40 some years ago, Korea, Korea's comparative advantage at that point was growing rice. It was very poor. The average education in Korea level was about four and a half years. Uh, their per capita income was lower than India's at that time. It was about $150 per capita. And the IMF and the World Bank said to Korea, uh, you should specialize in rice production. 
And Korea's response was thanks, but no thanks. Uh, even if we become the most efficient rice growers, we'll still be poor. Uh, they had higher aspirations. And so, ignored the, ignoring the advice of the IMF and the World Bank, they, they uh, began a process of industrialization. They got Japan to build a, uh, a steel mill, and it wound up being more efficient in the production of steel than any American company. Uh, they learned how to produce steel. But you don't learn how to produce steel by reading a textbook. The only way you're going to learn how to produce steel is to produce steel. And then think about how you improve it. So this is an example of, again, how a learning perspective really differs from the static allocated perspective. The learning perspective says, what are the sectors where we can learn and where that learning will have benefits for the entire economy? We sometimes call this the infant economy argument um, for uh, protection and for, for industrial policy. One of the mistakes that the e European Union made was to prescribe these policies. Because while they recognized at the beginning that there was a need for convergence, they recognized that the EU was not an optimal currency area. There was too much disparity and they needed to converge. They misdiagnosed what was required for convergence. They thought all that was required for convergence was low debt and deficit relative to GDP. But Spain and Ireland had surpluses before the crisis. It wasn't their deficit and debt that caused the crisis, it was the crisis that caused the debt deficit. What was needed for convergence was active industrial policies. But EU uh, 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 rules about state aid prescribed many of those views. So the new view, uh, in short, the new view is that industrial policies are desirable. And this is a marked change in the view about industrial policies. It's a view, as I say, it's a new view that is now uh, even the World Bank uh, subscribes to. Uh, and it's consistent with some countries uh, trying to promote new energy sources uh, and uh, uh, other policies. And let me just say, as, as, as uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the comments I often get is, is uh, having these policies been a failure, in fact, uh, government technology policies have been extraordinarily successful. Uh, if you ask what were the policies, what, what was the major source of growth in the United States in the uh, latter part of the 20th century, it was the internet and biotech. Both of those industries were a result of government policies. Uh, when I was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, we did a study of the average returns on government investments in technology. And the returns, the average returns, were well over 70%. So let me conclude. I've explained both the role of creating a learning society and increasing standards of living and why markets won't do this on their own. Some governments have recognized this more than others. The learning perspective is about every aspect of the economy, every aspect of society, every economic policy. Uh, as you look at it, you can ask, you know, are, am I promoting learning or am I impeding learning? Is this promoting an industry that is encouraging societal learning or is it encouraging an industry which is impeding or, or not promoting learning? So this is a very different perspective on the question of resource allocation. It's saying, how do we design our whole economy, our whole society, to promote learning? Some governments have set forth policies to try to create more inclusive learning societies. Those societies, for instance, in Scotland, from which the Enlightenment came, have also realized that one can best achieve such a learning society only by creating a more democratic, liberal, political process. I began with the theme that the Enlightenment brought increases in standards of living 
beyond anything imaginable before that time. But the last third of a century has brought two new challenges. Whether the fruits of those gains will be shared in some countries, we have seen that they have not. For instance, in the United States, median incomes today are lower than they were a quarter century ago. So while their GDP has gone up, the income of the typical Americans has stagnated. And the second is whether the pace of those gains can be sustained. We have learned that econo economics and politics and broader social structures are intertwined. It was liberal democracies that brought these gains from which all of humanity has benefited. It is only through the strengthening and perfecting of liberal democracies that we will be able to achieve sustained and shared prosperity. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Stiglitz, for inspiring lecture. We received a large number of questions on the internet, so I, I will just, uh, because we created Ask Stiglitz at CU, who, HU um, page. So I choose two questions from those. Uh, first, what policy considerations would you suggest for the leaders of a small open uh, country to achieve sustained prosperity in general? Second, China puts a big emphasis on education and research, but is by no standard a liberal democracy. What explains their success then? And then we open the floor also for questions from the public. Well, uh, I expected a question about China. Um, uh, the, the, the point I made in my talk was that sometimes you can uh, achieve a, uh, some success in the initial stages, borrowing knowledge from other, others. But what's quite striking is that as China has closed that gap, it's become much more open. Uh, it's much more open than, than, than it was. Uh, I think that it will not be able to sustain this its economic growth uh, and actually close the gap unless it becomes a more open society. That, that there's, there's been a process of opening, uh, uh, but it's a, it's a slow process. Uh, but uh, the, qu the question is, will it be able to sustain uh, its, uh, its process of closing the gap between the United States and the advanced countries? And I think it's going to be very difficult for it to do that um, uh, if it doesn't open up. That certainly has been what's happened in Korea, it's what's happened in Taiwan, uh, it's happening in, uh, right now in, in other countries, that in Singapore and uh, 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 and other countries in which uh, there has been this process of, of closing the gap, and they've, they've uh, uh, realized that if they want a sustained, you know, that's why I say you want to have sustained growth, uh, it, it's going to be necessary to, to change uh, the, pol uh, the polity. Uh, the question about the small open economy, uh, there are uh, still, there are many policies uh, and in fact, in many ways, a lot of the issues that I, I talk about uh, uh, are particularly uh, relevant to a small open economy. Let me, uh, sweet, the Scandinavian countries are all relatively small open economies. Um, and uh, one of the reasons that they uh, have adopted policies which are include strong welfare stakes, strong po uh, policies which, which um, uh, limit the degree of inequality in their societies, is because they realize that if they're going to continue to grow, they have to keep political support for openness and for change. But they won't be able to maintain that support for openness and change if it's the case that large fractions of their population don't benefit from openness and change. And so their view was that the welfare state is actually a necessary part of their economic agenda of growth. It's, it's not a luxury, 
that because they are rich, they, they uh, can afford the welfare state. It's quite the contrary. It's because it's, it's a necessary part of their ability to sustain economic growth is to make sure that there is this kind of shared prosperity. So for them, the policies of, again, of openness, uh, uh, inclusiveness, are absolutely uh, an essential part of the economic agenda. There are two other aspects of that that maybe I should mention uh, in particular. Uh, they have, uh, they spend a lot of resources, say Norway, it's an interesting case because Norway is a country that you might say has the benefit of a large uh, natural resources. But in spite of that, they're spending lots of money on industrial policies. <laughs> so they're, they're not content to just rest on their industrial, on, on, their, on their natural resources. Uh, one of the reasons is natural resources don't give rise to a lot of jobs. But they also don't give rise to sustained growth because eventually you run out of the natural resources. So what they've been doing is taking some of the proceeds of those natural resources and investing them in R&D, investing them in promoting certain industries. Some of these are related to their own oil industry. For instance, if you have an oil industry, you have pumps. But when you have oil pumps, those pumps can be adapted to other industries. So they developed a global, a, a, a global pump industry. <laughs> And so they're making money, a small country, making money from selling pumps all over the world. Um, another thing which I think is very striking about uh, uh, what they've done is they've, uh, as part of their, their economic agenda, their inclusive agenda, is a very strong investment in gender equality. It's part of, you know, we say, what is it? What is, important in creating a, a high standard of living for all of their society. And they say, well, we, we have a small population, but we can make our population more productive. And we, we were at a, a, a meeting with the prime minister of, uh, Nor former prime minister of Norway, and she said, you know, today we receive, we have a larger income from the investments that we've made in women than we get from our oil. Now, whether that's you know, actually true or not, but it re reflected the spirit of what they were doing. And so they, 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 they have succeeded in investing in people, reinvesting, the, uh, you know, so while their resources below the ground have been diminished as they take oil, oil out, the resources above the ground in the people have actually increased. And, and that's one of the reasons why they've such a strong performing economy in almost every dimension. Please the public. Here is first uh, Professor Olga Pagano and then the gentleman. Yeah. No, I uh, really enjoyed very much your talk and in uh, particular the part in which you consider uh, the contradictions between uh, uh, property rights uh, and the learning democratic society, and now this is an important uh, national issue. However, uh, even from a technical point of view, I think that uh, knowledge is not a public good uh, like national defense, it is a global common. And uh, being a global common, the issue of governance is not an issue of uh, national governance, it's uh, an issue of international governance. And uh, in a way, we get a free riding problem also at that level. So each country may try to overinvest in closed science with respect to open science and free ride on the open science of other countries. And then uh, we get uh, a situation in which, because of the policies of the different countries, open science is uh, undersupplied. So if this is uh, the problem, uh, and you consider it as a form of unfair competition, perhaps we need some simple rule. Uh, for instance, the WTO should say that if you want to be part you know, of the uh, world trade uh, international system, you should spend a certain minimum amount in open science or something like that. Otherwise, you are not uh, really doing a type of competition which is a fair one. So the issue, I don't think, is only about democratic, national, global government, but it's also about uh, 
uh, global governance. Maybe the gentleman yeah, in the middle. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Push it up. Hello. Uh, I'm curious to know your opinion on the private ownership of academic journals and publishers. So my, my experience as an academic has made me think there's very little little ro uh, role for market forces in this area because academics are desperate to get published, advance their careers, and universities have to subscribe to the big journals and so on. So I see there seems to be very little benefit of private ownership in this area. And then, but then there's a huge cost in terms of uh, information not being open access, and insofar as we've got state universities, there's a huge cost for state universities paying expensive subscription fees and for academic books, which are many, many times more expensive in general than uh, non-academic books. So it just se it seems to me perhaps it's one of the best cases for nationalization is uh, academic publishers or academic journals, I was wondering what your view on that. Okay, both very good questions. Let me say, I've actually written a lot about uh, knowledge as a global public good. And uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, we, we, we ought to think about knowledge as a global public good. There are actually, uh, uh, there have been some uh, serious proposals along the lines of what you talked about uh, in the area of public health, the WHO, has come forward with a, uh, a particular proposal for uh, uh, research in uh, areas of diseases that affect everybody in the world and proposed a, effectively a global tax uh, that in proportion to people's ability, the country's ability to pay that would go to support the basic research for, for diseases. So I think that is what we ought to be doing. I mean, I'm very supportive uh, of, of, of that kind of a proposal. But um, while knowledge is a global public good, I perhaps overemphasize the extent to which knowledge actually flows freely across boundaries, because it's still uh, uh, the, a company that does research even if it isn't patented, has an advantage. And that's uh, a lot of the open source models are, have shown that they can work basically because the people who do the research can still get a lot of the value. And an example, there are lots of, uh, the, one of the, the, the most innovative um, firms in the United States uh, uh, before, uh, uh, around 1980 was AT&T on Bell Labs. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, uh, Bell Labs at one point had more Nobel Prize winners than any country other than the United States. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, Bruce and I met, we were both working at, at uh, uh, Bell Labs. Uh, so, um, and what's interesting about Labs was that they, uh, uh, had such a dominance that they signed in, I think, 1956, a consent decree saying that all their patents were freely available. So they had no, no patent protection. What drove them, though, was that in the process of research, they learned so much that increased their learning capacity so that there was no reason, they, they were, they, they learned so much that they had no reason not to make it freely available. You know, that was, they were still, so that was very consistent with, you might say, a learning economy, a learning society. Um, so uh, there are, are um, uh, one, one, can, one can, even in a, in a system where knowledge is somewhat porous and you don't appropriate all the returns and there's some incentive to be a free rider, there is still an incentive to uh, do research. Uh, the final thing, I, uh, uh, or maybe an illustration of this principle, is uh, China's subsidies, uh, China's supporting of research for solar panels. 
much of the idea, the, uh, the ideas of their improvement in solar, you know, they've gotten moved down the cost curve for the production of solar panel, which is a very important step for uh, the issue of global warming. Now, a lot of this is protected by patents, but they're not worried about so much about patents. The point is that they've learned how to produce, it's, it's tacit knowledge that even if somebody took their knowledge, they wouldn't be, took the, even if they made their patents free, it would not be possible for anybody to be, imitate them and get cost as low as they, they can get it. Uh, and it's just a little bit of an aside, is that I think it's such a mistake of the United States and, and uh, the West uh, to try to stop China's solar panels from coming in, that, that we've, we, put, we put high tariffs on them, and saying it's unfair that they have subsidized global, uh, to try to create, deal with the problem of global warming. So we put, put the notion of jobs before the priority of dealing with, with global warming. Anyway, um, the, uh, I agree with you very much on, on the issue that, that uh, uh, private publishers of journals uh, are having very little value added. And it's a real instance where with changing in technology with, with e-journals, that there's very little re rationale for this. But the established journals ha are entrenched and it's very hard to move from one equilibrium to another. So um, uh, uh, the, uh, what I think, what ought to, you know, one way of dealing with it, uh, you know, the, what in the, some of the hard sciences, the way the journals survive is that in grants, the, 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 the uh, uh, researchers pay for having the papers published. Um, and that they live off of those uh, research grants. And I think it would change the technology, uh, the, the, the business model enormously if anybody who had a grant was required to publish in a journal that was distributed at a very low price. I think if you did that, it would bring about the end of these uh, monopolistic journals. And I think that would be a good thing. Time for two more questions. Third, third row, gentlemen. And, uh, and the gentleman in that row. Next to, yeah. I'm Laszlo Bito, the first sufferer of the by law, the law uh, the act that encouraged uh, university researchers to uh, patent. Uh, now that sounded very good from the economic point of view, but it essentially took the fun out of basic research. It ended when at a conference, the first time I heard, I'm not at liberty to talk about it. And that was a tremendous uh, negative effect on research that was driven by curiosity, and therefore it went in all different directions. From then on, much of the research was focused on to get a patent and have economic advantage. But that's not my major problem with patent. When we talk about intellectual rights, we usually, well, at least here, we talked about patent. But there is also the copyright. Now, the patent is for 20, 21 year protection. Uh, copyright is 70 years after the death of the author. And this many young musicians cannot make out there what they want to play on the basis of what they really enjoy, but what they get permission from somebody that may have nothing to do with the, the original uh, creating the, the piece. So um, I think that 70 years, worse, 70 years after the death versus 20 years, it's a very bad situation. And because of this, the pharmaceutical companies justify the incredible high price of drugs because they only have 20 years of protection. So I think something needs to be done 
and I would like to hear your opinion about it. Thank you. Uh, uh, in your presentation, you have emphasized the role of innovation. But my impression was that, uh, at least until the end, you have mainly talked about R&D-based innovations, and you have emphasized the role of market failure, so you have not mentioned systemic failures at all. You did mention in, in your last answer the, the importance of, of tacit knowledge and also a little bit of practical knowledge, learning by doing. Uh, you also emphasized the role of government in creating knowledge and encouraging learning, but I think the real important question is what type of knowledge should be generated, how to diffuse it, how to exploit it, and therefore what type of government policies would be needed uh, j just to put to extremes whether uh, tackling market failures would be sufficient or, or other failures like systemic failures where because of lacking components in a system or insufficient uh, linkages between the various actors in an innovation system and so on and so forth should lock in. So th there are, uh, th there's a huge literature on that and you, you have not mentioned anything from, from, from that field of economics, evolutionary economics of innovation. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me just take the last question first. I mean, obviously, I, I already talked too long, and, and uh, I couldn't deal with everything. And, and uh, the book is a very big book, so, so I just encourage you to, to read it. Because uh, I do talk about many of these, uh, not all of them, because the subject is very broad. Uh, uh, I talk about uh, a number of them. Just let me mention, uh, uh, and I agree with uh, everything uh, basically you said, um, that um, uh, some of this is, is, is vocabulary. Uh, I use market failure in a very broad way, including, for instance, uh, the issue of labor mobility. Uh, one of the ways in which information learning occurs is people moving from one job to another. Uh, I don't know if you follow the recent uh, uh, attempt that was made by Apple uh, and the other Silicon Valley companies to have a collusive agreement not to hire each other to make sure that labor didn't move. And uh, it was an, a violation of antitrust laws, but they, they, their view was by do it, making this agreement, they could drive down w uh, wages. Um, but it also had a learning effect because it, it, it undermined the knowledge movement from one place to another. So um, there are many, many other uh, uh, aspects of learning that I haven't had a chance to talk about. Another aspect that I think is very, very important is institutional learning. Um, many countries uh, uh, have not learned how to run industrial policies in the past. There were a lot of failures, but now we've learned a lot better about industrial policies. Um, many governments uh, including the American government, didn't run monetary policies very well. There's been institutional learning. Um, we've abandoned, in the United States, fortunately, we've done some learning and we've abandoned inflation targeting. Uh, some countries still have not abandoned inflation targeting. So, so there's institutional learning in the aftermath of the crisis, the, a lot of institutional learning that went on, and in some places there was less institutional learning. So there, what, I, what I just want to say is, is these are a lens through which hopefully there'll be discussions that will uh, re-examine uh, almost every policy in our, in our society be, to, to ask the question, how does it affect learning? Uh, the question about uh, uh, copyright, patent law, uh, uh, are re were really important, really interesting uh, questions, and I, uh, I've written a, a lot about that. Uh, and let me just make just a, a, a few uh, comments. Uh, I was, I, from a policy perspective, I got involved in these issues when I was on the Council of Economic Advisors. And I saw, uh, and we were involved at the time in the negotiation for the Uruguay round, uh, agreement that led to TRIPS and the uh, 
establishment of the WTO and the intellectual property, the global, the current global economic uh, uh, intellectual property regime. And let me make it very clear: um, the American academic community did not think that TRIPS was a good idea. Uh, Council of Economic Advisors did not think that TRIPS. We we argued against the formulation as it went, uh, as it was adopted. TRIPS was the result largely of the influence of two industries, the pharmaceutical industry and the entertainment industry. You ask the question, why do we have a 70-year copyright? When an author writes a book, you know, when I write a book, do I really care about the uh, sales of my book 70 years after my death? I do worry about my descendants, but not, I, I don't worry, worry about uh, my royalty 70 years after my death. What was that about? It was about one thing, Mickey Mouse. It was about Disney wanting to protect its intellectual property, its corporate interest in Minnie Mouse, Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck. That's what it was about. And the consequence for young musicians or for anything else was secondary. Uh, you know, you talked about that. Joy, James Joyce scholars are very upset about uh, their inability to get access to a lot of, of, his, uh, of, his, uh, of his work. So um, that was an example of something that was very driven by these two, two industries. Um, the, um, and it wasn't a balanced intellectual property regime. It tried to put the same intellectual property regime for develop and developing countries. And that's why WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, called for a development-oriented intellectual property regime, which is quite different from TRIPS. Uh, one of the things that concerns me right now is that the United States is in its trade agreements, in the proposed trade agreements with Europe and its proposed trade agreement with the Pacific, TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, that's what it's called, um, has tried to make things even worse. They don't say make things worse. That, uh, to make stronger intellectual property, to make it access to life-saving medicines more difficult, access to generic medicines more difficult, worsen the problems that you were talking about. So in fact, uh, if you're worried about the way things are, if, you, if Europe signs this new trade agreement, things will be worse. Um, now, uh, and, and as you said, uh, Baidol made things worse by making the universities more, less open, less oriented towards real knowledge production and more interested in, in production of profits. Um, on the final question of what is there an alternative, well, actually, I think there are lots of alternatives. If you look at the production process of drugs, there's the basic research, then there's development of the basic research into drugs, and then there's the testing. The first is done mostly in universities already. And the problem is, really arises in the testing. The testing is the very expensive part, but if you thought about it, conflicts of interest, would you want the person who is, has developed the drug to test whether his drug is safe and efficacious. There's an obvious conflict of interest. You really want the testing to be done by an independent tester. And if you look at the way the testing is done in the United States and in some other countries, testing is actually part of marketing. So they get a lot of people involved in the testing so that they are invested in the product. They get the doctors involved and then they become the marketer. So I've actually written about how to design a public testing system that would be an alternative to the current. So you would divide these three stages, the basic research, then you would have the private development of the drug, and then you would have a separate public testing. You might contract out some of that, but it would not 
have the current bundling of the stage two and three. And that would actually create a much more competitive marketplace and, a, and lower cost um, and, and would be a way of addressing some of the uh, attempts, uh, the, 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 some of the worst abuses of the current uh, intellectual fr property framework. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, last three comments. First, everybody is invited to reception at Nadarutsa 9, the May building of the university. Second, the audience is asked kindly to remain seated by the platform our distinguished guests leave. And third, join me to thank uh, Professor Stiglitz for a fascinating evening. Thank you.